Hey everyone, this is Zico Callahan, and I and the channel Raptor Chatter are part of Paleo Rewind 2022, largely organized by the channel Edge. So go check them out, but also all the other people that are participating. For today's video though, we're gonna be looking at what happened for paleontology in February. And there's a lot of papers that are a lot broader, but this is just a narrow selection of some of the most interesting. So let's get started where it all begins. And by that I mean chronologically, we're looking at the oldest fossil of the papers that I've chosen. And that's because this one talks about an animal closely related to Opabinia. Opabinia is a fossil from the Burgess Shale, and it's really the inspiration for Stephen Jay Gould's book, Wonderful Life and the history of the Burgess Shale, because it's really unlike anything and it helps to punctuate a lot of those ideas of Look, life evolved really quickly after the Cambrian explosion. The thing is, this new animal, Euterora camosa, doesn't come from the Burgess Shale, instead coming from Utah and specifically the Wheeler Formation. Now, Opabinia has often been considered this really unique animal because there's nothing else in the fossil record quite like it. And that's because it had five eyes and this weird claw at the front, and also these kind of wing-like appendages, including a little bit of further pointed up wings towards the tail. So it's really, really unique. I think it's a little less unique now because there's another one. And again, coming from around the same time during the late Cambrian. So it wasn't necessarily that this one lineage just split off and became Opabinia, this totally, totally unique animal. Instead, it looks like maybe Opabinia was part of a larger group that did specifically evolve those adaptations rather than just being a single lineage that led to it. So maybe Stephen Jay Gould was kind of jumping the gun a bit, although he also wrote the book way back in the day. So it's not necessarily that shocking when we didn't have nearly as many fossils as we do today. And jumping way up, we're gonna be going to the middle Jurassic of the Isle of Skye, a small island off the coast of Scotland. But it has had a lot of really unique geological and paleontological finds. So it's really useful for understanding some of the really important times of dinosaur, and also importantly in this case, pterosaur evolution. And that's because they found the first really big bodied pterosaur coming from the middle Jurassic. And the really cool part is it's not even related to the other later larger pterosaurs, which mostly lost their tails. Instead, this one still had a tail. Jark Skignath, which the name is in Scottish, so if I'm not pronouncing that right, Scottish viewers, please let me know. It comes from this Isle of Skye, and importantly again, it's a large pterosaur relative to the time. Most of the other pterosaurs we find around this time that are related to it are things like Rampharynchus, which is much, much smaller, maybe the size of a pretty large crow or raven. Meanwhile, this one had a wingspan as large as a man. And the thing is, it probably got even larger than that. They actually were able to cut open sections of the bone and look at some growth rings, and they suggest, no, this thing was even still growing at this time. It wasn't necessarily a small organism said no, it was definitely still growing, it was a very large pterosaur for this time period. And it kind of goes against what we've normally thought about, oh, the pterosaurs stayed really small up until just about the Cretaceous, and then they got big in the Cretaceous. No, they got big pretty quickly after first evolving. Staying with the pterosaurs, but this time jumping to China, we're looking at Kung Pengopterus. This animal actually made the news last year because a newly found species of it was found to have had an opposable thumb. And the original species that this study is on may have also had that thumb. The fossils just really aren't preserved in an orientation to identify if it did have that opposed thumb. However, these ones actually come with some of the gut contents preserved, which is really cool because we can start narrowing down what they definitely ate and potentially what their diets may have been. The thing is, both of these are pretty similar because they both contain fish and not really much else. So that may suggest that they may have been fish specialists, essentially going around feeding on fish, and then eventually they died, washed into the lake where those fish were, but towards the bottom there wasn't oxygen, meaning that the fossil was pretty well preserved. I do want to mention though, before you jump to conclusions, that this is a sample size of exactly two, uh, so it's not really great when you consider how many of these organisms would have lived throughout the species' entire time frame. So we really would hopefully like to find more fossils like this so we can have a good amount of a sample size to try and say, oh yeah, they probably were fish specialists as opposed to they may have been. And we're gonna be staying in the same time period and the same place, except this time looking at a mammal. Cocotherium geofutingensis is this new mammal. And the thing is, it doesn't seem super unique unless you really know what you're looking for. And that's because of certain structures in the jaw. Mammal jaws are just fundamentally weird because we really only have the one bone making up our lower jaw. Meanwhile, in most other animals, there's multiple bones making up the lower jaw. 
because as evolution progressed, mammals had two of those bones move inside the ear, meaning that we do have more precise hearing. The thing is, that also means that our lower jawbone, the single one there, had to do more things. And there was something called Meckel's cartilage there. Meckel's cartilage is cartilage alongside parts of the lower jaw, which would have helped to attach different muscle ligaments. However, the important part is, we don't have Meckel's cartilage because it's turned entirely to bone. So it's something that's totally different from what this animal had. Almost. Because we can actually see some of that cartilage, because this is again very fine preservation, starting to change into bone. Essentially, the evolutionary process of moving from cartilage to bone is taking place in Cocotherium. So we have a really great landmark for understanding how some of the evolution of the mammal jaw actually occurred. So in 2017, for my wife and I's one year anniversary, we went to Japan. And one of the places we visited was the Fukui Prefectural Dinosaur Museum. And that means we got to see the fossils of Fukui Venator on display. And that's what this paper is about, Fukui Venator. In large part because it's kind of been in a confusing place. It's not the most complete fossil in the world and has some really interesting characteristics. For example, some of the teeth towards the front of the mouth are definitely pointed and for grabbing small prey but some of the ones towards the back are more peg-like and likely for eating plants, so it was kind of this omnivore. Additionally, many studies had kind of found it up in the air phylogenetically. It was some sort of solorosaur, but that's a really big group. It includes compsognathids and tyrannosaurs and all of the bird-like dinosaurs, as well as a few other groups. And this study helps narrow down which one of those other groups it may have actually belonged to, because they found that it was the basal most therizinosaur. The most famous Therizinosaur is Therizinosaurus because it had massive three foot long claws that it likely used to help pull on tree branches and then eat those plants. The thing is though, Fukui Venator doesn't perfectly fit into this kind of body plan in part because it was much smaller. I mean, you can see the entire fossil of Fukui Venator here. Meanwhile, here I am next to a cast of another Therizinosaur, Nothernicus, at the Museum of Northern Arizona. So some of the later Therizinosaurs got much larger. And that's something we don't really see happening in Fukui Venator. But that does make at least some sense because here we can still see that it was at least somewhat of an omnivore. Again, some sharp teeth for grabbing prey and some peg teeth for eating plants. They also looked at the tail vertebra and found that the last few of these were actually fused. This is something that's called a pygostyle or a pygostyle, depending on who you are. But all modern birds have it because that's what makes the broad tail fan of feathers in modern birds. And that means that this animal also would have potentially had that same kind of tail fan, which is important because in general, that means it would have had flight type feathers. They would have been asymmetrical and leaned to one side, essentially. That means that potentially the first flight feathers evolved before Therizinosaurs split off from the lineage that would eventually become the birds. And we're gonna stay in the Cretaceous, but this time jump all the way over to Portugal. And that's because there was a new Spinosaurid found. And Spinosaurids are sometimes the bane of my existence because like this new one, Iberospinus natorioi, they all seem to be pretty incomplete. And you can see that from this diagram of the fossil here. Now it does still have some unique traits that do help it warrant its own specific category rather than falling into something like Baryonyx or many of the other Spinosaurids which have been found in parts of England and also Spain and Portugal. One of these is that it has only a single nerve coming out of the Maclean sulcus, and that would have helped to give it facial sensation around that area. And the Maclean sulcus isn't the cartilage, but it is named for the same guy, it's just a small depression in the bone. And while they are kind of the bane of my existence because they are partial, and this one is extremely partial, it is important to note that it is unique. Because what that means is that, again, I mentioned Iberia, so Portugal and Spain having a lot of Spinosaurus, but also, England had a lot of Spinosaurs. So what we're potentially seeing is the origin point for this group. Essentially, they may have evolved around this part of Western Europe and then migrated further across the world later in time. And that's because in general, wherever you find the greatest diversity of a group is where it originated from. And now getting towards the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, we're gonna be looking at some of the rocks that come from India, specifically around the Deccan Traps. The Deccan Traps were a series of really large volcanoes that were erupting right around the time of the non-avian dinosaurs extinction 66 million years ago. And in fact, it's been suggested they may have been the cause as opposed to the impact from space. The thing is, between many of these different volcanic layers, you also get some sandstones and mudstones, and sometimes those preserve fossils. 
such as here with a fossil fruit. The fruit was found to be a member of the Euphorbiaceae. This group includes some modern, really useful trees, such as the castor oil tree or the rubber tree. So it's really cool to know that this group evolved before the extinction that killed the non-avian dinosaurs. But also it's appearing between these different volcanic sediments, which the fact is that if the plants aren't necessarily going extinct right where this eruption is happening, maybe they weren't the cause for that extinction. And for my final paper that I'm bringing up, we're still gonna be looking at that extinction specifically at the Tannis site in North Dakota. And the lead author, Melanie During, actually has her own video of this paper up on her own channel. And I highly recommend checking it out because A, she's gonna be better at explaining it since she did the groundwork, but also importantly, there was some controversy involving this paper because another researcher, it seems like at least essentially, uh, took all of the data and made up some data to fill in the gaps and just stole the release of this paper from her. Essentially, he knew this paper was coming out, and so he made his own paper and released it first so that he could get the credit. And for more of the details on that ethics issue, Edge is going to be doing the video for the month that that news released, which is December. So that'll be out on the 31st of this year, so very, very end of this year. But essentially, the paper does suggest that the impact happened in the early spring. So you would have had a lot of new growth of plants and then just suddenly nothing. And that would have just exacerbated the issues that were happening at the time. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you want longer monthly updates, feel free to check out my channel because I do do those and I talk about some of these papers in more detail and or bring up some papers that aren't necessarily as important for a year in the review, at least for the average person. Months in review really do take a lot of work. I have that from experience. And so feel free to check out my Patreon where you can try and support me and also check out how you can support the other channels. They all put in a lot of work on this too. And it really does help us to be able to kind of, you know, keep the lights on. With that said, everyone, be safe, take care. Don't go extinct. <laughs>